Okay, everyone will be joining us in just a minute. Thank you for returning. Those of you online, we're just getting settled here in the Zendo. Just one more minute, please. Thank you. Hi, gorgeous. Welcome back. Let's see how I can fit myself into the screen. Here we go. Well, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, can you hear me online okay? Okay, great. This morning, uh, it's with great honor I get to introduce our Abbott and co-founder, Roshi Joshin Althaus, who needs no introduction among us, but over 30 years of Zen experience is uh, looking to have a conversation with the Sangha this morning uh, in a conversation called trust thank you roshi okay you can turn that off and put it on that yeah okay you can control that thing right okay good morning everyone happy new year 2024 we did it we survived 2023 So I'd like to start by having a conversation about trust. I want to start with a question. What do you trust? What do you trust? And if you, if you want to say something, you grab the microphone. If you're in the room, if you're online, you can just unmute yourself and speak up. What do you, Gary? Grab the microphone and make sure it's turned on in uh, June, May, and you go back to your, yeah, I should, we'll leave it turned on for, for the rest of the day. First of all, you can all hear me online and you speak up, Gary. Can you, yes. Can you hear Gary? Yes. Okay. Yeah, good morning, everybody. So you can sit back down. So I just want to say something before Gary speaks. It may be intimidating for you have to get up and grab the microphone, but please get used to it. This is uh, the the venue that we're we have to use, and I'm going to really invite you all to participate in the conversation. So don't be afraid to get up, grab the microphone. There are no right or wrong answers here, and this is a loving sangha, so we can all participate and enjoy each other's. Uh, company together. Okay, Gary. Thank you, Roshi, and good morning, everybody. Uh, one thing that I trust, uh, there are a lot of things that I don't trust, and I probably have more of a reputation for not trusting people and, and things, uh -huh. uh, but I do trust that there is a concept of impermanence, and uh, I, I just uh, read a book, not about, not related to Buddhism, but it was uh, about impermanence in our lives and in nature, and uh, many examples were illustrated about how, how impermanence is real and ongoing and has been and will be. So let me, let's be really specific. You trust that there's a concept of impermanence. That concept we created because of our experience of something we call impermanence, right? Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and it's a, obviously a basic teaching of Buddhism that Life is impermanent. We're all, everything is changing. Um, this table here that's holding my cup of tea is seemingly real, right? I trust that it's going to hold my cup of tea for now. But I also know it's broken. I know this table is broken. And because I know that, it's precious to me. 
because I know you're broken. You're precious to me. And I think if we didn't, if impermanence wasn't the nature of reality that we all experience, I think what cause, what leads to intimacy and uh, love and preciousness, uh, tenderness, is that we all know we're not going to be here forever. We're all broken. Yeah? Doesn't that lead to some kind of care, attention, love? But yeah. We can trust impermanence. What else? What do you trust? Big or small? Anybody? Okay, I'll ask you another question. Do you trust this? Do you trust this? Because I'm holding up a $20 bill. Do you trust this? Come on, anybody. You don't know if you trust this? Do you trust this? What? It's not spiritual enough? What, 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 what is it? You, you, do you not trust this? So far, so good. <laughs> if I take this over to Pete's and I give it to, I get some uh, coffee or something and I give it to the cashier, I trust that I'm going to be able to get the coffee in exchange, right? So don't you trust this? Terrorists trust this. In the Middle East, terrorists are, that absolutely disagree with everything in our culture. They're trying to bring us down. They will still trust this American dollar to buy weapons with. Believe me, they will trust this. This is the global currency. So don't you trust this? We all agree. We make a, we have a, it even says in here, in God we trust on the bill. I don't know about that, but I, I trust this. I'm not sure if I trust God. I'm not sure what that means. But I trust this. We have made a consensual agreement to trust this. Now, if there was a run on the banks, if the economy was to go into the toilet and everything, people are trying to withdraw their money, maybe I wouldn't trust this so much anymore. And I would... I would go try to get gold or Bitcoin or something else. Yeah, but right now, pretty much trust this. How about this? Holding up a, my prime, prime Amazon credit card. It's a Visa card. Should I trust this? Do you think I trust this? Yeah, I trust it. I, I trust that if I if I use this if I go online and I I buy a book from Amazon, uh, it might be a Kindle book. I don't ever get the product physically. It's an electronic transaction, right? But I will get something on my Kindle that will be downloaded to my Kindle, and I did it with this. I didn't actually do it with this card. I have the card on record on my computer. It's all an electronic transaction. And I trust that. Now, if I'm ordering a book, I generally trust that Amazon will deliver it in two days. But they might not. It might get lost. But generally, I trust this. Don't you trust your credit cards? You probably use your credit card more than you use cash these days. Now, um, over my vacation, I was reading um, Yuval Harari's books. Uh, one first book he wrote, I think, was Sapien. And then he wrote another one, and then he wrote 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And, and Yuval is a historian who asks large questions. And in Sapiens, he was exploring the nature of what it is to be a homo sapien, which is what we are. We are homo sapiens. We are, we are part of the animal kingdom, though. We are animal. We are mammals, right? 
we forget that because we're wearing clothes and we walk on two legs and we forget that we're actually part of part of the animal kingdom. And what Yuval says, and it's really intriguing, is that um, Homo sapiens, there were other, there were like Neanderthal man and Homo erectus, there were other kinds of human beings before us Homo sapiens. And in fact, like Neanderthal man that died out was bigger and stronger than us Homo sapiens. If, if I as a Homo sapien met a Neanderthal man, he could beat the shit out of me. He was bigger than me, he was stronger. And yet, Neanderthal man died out. Why? Homo sapiens had something, a, a unique skill. First of all, Homo sapiens learned to cook their food. Because they cooked their food, they didn't have to have, we didn't have to have such big jaws and big teeth, and we didn't have to have such long intestines to digest our food, so we grew bigger brains. And the one thing that Homo sapiens did that other animals don't do is we could imagine something that's not here. We can imagine, I can imagine a pink elephant right now. It's not in the room. I can sort of picture it. It's a little funny looking. And you can all do that too, right? Right now, you can imagine something that's not here. Now, because we have this uh, skill, we can organize, we can tell stories. Generally, according to Yuval, most animals can't organize more than 150 of them together at one time. If you put a thousand gorillas in, the, in, a build, in a room in the UN, it would be pandemonium. They wouldn't know what to do. You put a 10,000 homo sapiens in a big room in the UN and we will organize that. We, we know how to do that. And part of the way we organize is by telling stories. Myth. Stories are powerful. If the story is powerful enough, compelling enough, it can, it can uh, activate our imagination, it can inspire us to organize together, to do things together. All kinds of stories, right? And it's not that the story is, uh, how can I say it? The story is a fiction. We, it doesn't mean it's bad, but we create, we imagine stories. Religions have stories. Countries, people, we have stories about how to govern. There was fascism was a compelling story up until the end of World War II. It was based on absolute loyalty to the nation, right? And uh, the word fascism, uh, where is it? Interesting, it means I think rods together. How is it? Bundle of rods is the literal meaning of fascism. Sounds kind of innocuous, right? Bundle of rods. Bundle of rods, R-O-D-S. Sounds kind of innocuous, right? Until you, you really get the implication of that. The collective is always more important than the individual. In fascism, what makes that a powerful story, if you buy into it, is that we all agree to, to sacrifice everything for the state right? Everything is for the state. The individual doesn't count. And if we buy into that story, that's a powerful story for getting something done as a collective. But it requires that each of us absolutely give up, give up our individuality for the, the sake of the, the state. Communism, another, and, and fascism had the power to organize 
millions of people, right? Same thing with communism or our liberal government now. All of these were very powerful stories that compelled people to sacrifice their lives for them. And religion is no different. I, I, I'm, I'm not picking on Catholicism but, uh, or Christianity, but it's a, it's obvious. It's an obvious story. Uh, we, have, we have stories in Buddhism too. The story of the Buddha's life is a story. Do we really know that it's subjectively true? Does it matter? It doesn't really matter, does it? If, if, we discover, if some scholar discovered that the Buddha didn't actually live in Northern India or they, uh, he lived somewhere else, would that discredit the story? Or that he hadn't given a, certain, a, sermon, uh, a particular talk that was in one of the sutras? Do we know that the sutras are accurate? You take the story in Christianity. Christ died on the cross for, you, for my sins, to save me from my sins. That's a compelling story. Anytime there's a story about someone sacrificing themselves, martyring themselves for the jihad, for a soldier that sacrifices his life for my country, for my freedom, to question that story is about the worst thing you can do, right? Because you're questioning that person's sacrifice. You can't do that. I mean, you can, and people do, but it's not, it's not recommended. Stories are powerful. And if we question the story, the story, is what brings order to our culture. If you actually question the stories, you, be, you actually threaten chaos and social disruption and, and civil war. If you do not trust the referees, for instance, then how do you play a game of basketball? How would you play a game of basketball if there wasn't a referee? But Increasingly, we don't trust the referees. They have to have more safeguards now for baseball. They have a whole separate room somewhere where people sit down and review the plays of the referees because we don't trust the referees anymore. If you don't trust the justice system, can we have a democracy if we don't trust the legal system that created our, our way of governing? Is it possible? The justices are the ultimate arbitrators, aren't they? The judges. Now, see, we trust a lot of things in consent. It's our consensual reality, right? But. It's not objectively true as such. I mean, I trust that this table is holding my tea, but to say this table is true, no, it's, it's not, it, put this outside in the weather for, for a month and it's not true anymore. It's, it's, a, it's just ash, it's just, you know, a pile of wood, just like us, the table is impermanent. We could trust impermanence. So what else could we trust if we're, so can we agree that in terms of consensual reality, we agree to trust a lot of things so that we can organize ourselves as a culture, as a country, as a world to get things done. But we also know that increasingly people don't trust a lot of those things in our world. Increasingly, people don't trust institutions of all kinds. Institutions of learning. Someone, someone from Harvard just resigned because she said the wrong thing or upset somebody. I didn't follow it closely, but I saw it. So we don't trust courts, maybe. We don't trust religion, particularly. We don't trust authority figures. 
I'm a Zen teacher. A lot of people wouldn't trust me. In fact, we have a, a famous, one of our worthy Zen teachers in China said, there is no teacher of Zen. There is no such thing as a teacher of Zen. And the person said, well, then how come we're doing this stuff together? And he said, I didn't say there was no Zen. I just said there's no teacher of Zen. And why am I sitting up here? Because you all agreed that I was going to lead a conversation with you today. Here I am. So what else can we trust? Is there something we can trust that is more, uh, what's the word? Not just a consensual reality, but is there like something like impermanence? We could all agree that impermanence isn't something we agree. You you can you can question impermanence if you want to, but you're still gonna you're still impermanent unless you think that you're the chosen one and that you you know live forever. Then we would just say put you in an insane asylum. Jackie. I, um, when you first presented the question, I was thinking of the sunrise and the sunset. Uh -huh. um, and as you began to speak, I was it came to mind about the present moment. This in this moment, I trust it's happening. I'm witnessing it. I'm that I trust it's current. Uh -huh. It's now. Uh -huh. I trust now. Yes. Yeah, and yet it's hard to say what that is because it's already gone. So I trust, I trust then. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, the, at the end of our heart sutra says, gone, gone, go beyond, go beyond, going beyond. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is sounding like a teacher's pet. <laughs> um, I think I trust cause and effect. I trust karma. Something happens, something else will happen as a result of that. And, and it just, as I. Seems to be true, although there are examples of bad people that don't seem to suffer. Or it's perhaps bad people where we don't see the suffering. Uh -huh, that's possible. So, but for me, I'm learning to trust every action has its equal and opposite. It seems to this seems to be the way of our world, but uh, we could people could come down on that with different points of view. But if, according to Buddhism, anyway, according to our religion, uh, the universe is lawful, and what we do matters. So if you behave in a way that's kind and loving and mindful, there'll be a certain result, which will, the fruition of that behavior will be in the direction of something positive bring happiness, joy. If, you, if you're mean-spirited and you're picking on people all the time and hurting them, then you'll have another, you'll have another fruition of that behavior, which will tend to be in the direction of more anger and more turmoil and uh, more suffering. Yeah? Hmm? I was just going to add that uh, things I find to be true is interdependence and that like how we say in Jukai that the Buddha in me can see the Buddha in you mm -hmm. and I believe that to be true. So interdependence, uh, that's a, there's a lot of ways to talk about that teaching but one way in a sense we're talking about the teaching of emptiness for Shunyata which sounds like a concept, and if we talk about it, it is. But according to Buddhism, the nature of actually what's here, in terms of what, whatever we call reality, is empty, which means that none of us exist unto ourselves as a separate truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the sun was to not rise, I would not be here very long. I would, nor would any of you. We would all go the way of this 
table being set out in the alley after a few days. So we all depend on many things to be here. That's essentially the teaching of emptiness. We don't, we're not a separate island unto ourselves. There is no truth in our, that separate island as a self. And yet we tend to think of ourselves that way, don't we? Which tends to lead to selfish <coughs> behavior. I, I require water. I require food. I actually require community. We are social beings. We require each other to be healthy. You can't, if you just try to live it, well, it's happening. Increasingly, people are alienated and lonely in our culture. A lot of people are lonely in this culture. We are the loneliest country in the world. And that'll shorten your life. There's science, there's evidence in science that says if you don't have any friends, if you don't have anybody you can be with, you're, gonna, you're more likely to shorten your lifespan. One of the biggest predictors of longer life, surprisingly, is not whether you're thin or fat, which I like, the science of that. One of the biggest predictors of longer life is that you have good friends, good friends. Love, connection, empathy. We, we, we need this. Yeah. So that's the teaching. There are so many implications from that teaching of emptiness, and yet it's, it's very not easy to understand, and we turn it into a concept. But essentially, that is one of the most basic teachings of our religion, is that the, the actual nature of reality is, is what we're talking about when we use that word emptiness. Well, let's go back to what the Buddha actually said. Since we're attempting to be Buddhists, or we, has, or we trust this religion called Buddhism or Zen, you probably wouldn't be here, or you're learning to see if you want to trust it. You know, most religions don't allow for doubt. Doubt's not a, something that religions like. They want faith and loyalty. Because to question, again, to question the religion is to question the status quo, and that's dangerous. That's really dangerous. Now, our particular religion actually um, has a pretty uh, healthy appreciation of doubt. And the Buddha even said, you know, uh, take these teachings if they make sense to you. If they don't, don't, don't follow, don't do it. Find out for yourself. Be your own light and see if this teachings, if they make sense, then, then do it. If they don't, then don't do it. Find something else that does make sense. Now, what did the Buddha, what, the most, I think the thing the Buddha said most often was, I teach one thing and one thing only. I teach suffering and the cessation of suffering. That, you know, such a simple statement is clarifying, really clarifying. I teach suffering and the cessation of suffering. Well, we all know what suffering is. And as you get older, you know, you get to know what suffering is in the body. Think the body starts to break down. You know, when we're close to suffering, it opens the heart. We say, you know, our, our practice is to bear witness to our life, the joys and the sorrows, and the joy too, but the sorrows. Bear witness, be close to suffering. Your parents suffer. You suffer with them, don't you? 
You suffer with people you love, your kids, your parents, your family. Isn't that what it means to, to be a, a family or a community that we suffer together, that we're willing to do that? That's what the word compassion means, to be with passion, to be with our emotions, to be with our insecurities to be with our vulnerability. You know, you see, if you, we want to know what the meaning of life is. Uh, there's a, you know, you ask the question, what's the meaning of life? And you're expecting a story as an answer. You're not expecting a, a a, you know, a formula of some mathematical form. You're expecting a, a good story. So what's the meaning of life? Well, you could tell a story and maybe if it's convincing enough, you believe it. But maybe there's no meaning of life other than what we give, give the meaning to. We give life meaning by the story we imagine. Maybe a better question is, what is suffering? And how can I reduce suffering in myself and with others around me? Isn't that a, uh, seems to me that's more, uh, I can get, I can, I can work with that. I'm not sure I can work with the meaning of life other than to, watch a Monty Python film and laugh, have, la have a lot of laughs. I don't know if that's, there's one of the Monty Python films I love where the three guys are on the car. I don't, I don't mean to be sacrilegious. So if you're Christian, please, I want to, I don't mean to be offensive about your particular religion, but Monty Python, there's three people on the cross, you know, and they start singing. Always look on the bright side of life. So I'm being sacrilegious now. If you're, if the problem with religion is that we often, if you're really serious about your religion, you don't have any sense of humor about it. And that's too bad. Uh, in, in my religion, in Zen, we have, we're quite willing to be sacrilegious about our own beliefs and make fun of ourselves. Uh, I don't know if Monty Python has made a, a film about Buddhism yet. <laughs> Maybe they could. So I teach, suff I teach suffering and the cessation of suffering. We teach here at the Zen Center three signature classes. They're, we call them our signature classes, the Foundations of Mindfulness, the Path of Zen, and the Six Paramitas, three classes, three series. And that first series, which I'm going to be teaching, I think next Saturday, uh, the Foundations of Mindfulness is four classes. And I think it's important when we teach that we we be very clear about what is it that we are promising. What are we promising when we when we say, "Come take this class, practice meditation, practice mindfulness," and you're going to it's going to be some kind of benefit that accrues to you if you do this. We're promising that. The last class that we teach is in that series is called living a life of openness living a life of openness and that whole class is about embodied wisdom when we when we chanted the four vows this morning the the last vow is i vow to what is it i vow to awake I vow, I vow to embody it. I vow, I vow to embody enlightenment. Mm -hmm. 
we are so, uh, this culture is so complicated and so complex and we are so driven and busy and disembodied in so many ways. What we are teaching when we teach mindfulness in the context of Zen is that the first milestone on, a spirit, on our spiritual path is discovering that your embodied wisdom is your boot camp. It's your base. Your own direct experience is something we are, we are inviting you to learn about and to begin to trust in some way. Now, our embodied experience is nonverbal. It's not conceptual, not in my head. I can feel my seat on the chair. I can feel my feet touching the floor. And if I was nervous about giving this talk, I might feel butterflies in my, in my tummy. That's, that's embodied experience. Our, our body generally doesn't lie. So first milestone for us at this Zen Center, from my point of view, is discovering that we actually can trust the body as a source of wisdom, as a place of being grounded, being centered, being present to, as Jackie said, really show up here and be present, to be intimate, really be here. Not just be thinking you're here, but to be here, to be intimate. Saying you could trust that. You could learn to trust that. Maybe not all the time, but you could begin by sitting down on a cushion, sitting down on a chair, being brave enough to be with yourself long enough to begin to get your embodied wisdom. And then in the second class, the path of Zen, we introduce now the spiritual path of Zen. The first class on the foundations of mindfulness is entry level. How do we have to get started somewhere. And we start with meditation. That's our practice, part of our practice. Mindfulness, very helpful skill or tool to have in your toolbox. And then once we kind of trust this embodied wisdom, we can, that's, that's a basis on which we can build. We, that's a foundation you can build a spiritual path on. You don't build a spiritual path by just talking about metaphysics up here. You start down here where we are. We start with suffering because that's real. We start with trying to understand how we suffer, how we create suffering for ourselves and others. And then we, we develop an intention to, to try to do better. If we could understand suffering and how we create it, maybe we don't have to do that anymore, or we do it less. We move in the direction of less suffering. So we teach, it's a little confusing because in the uh, path of Zen, the first class, we, we teach a whole class on what is called the four foundations of mindfulness in Buddhism from the Satipatthana Sutra. It's a teaching of Buddhas. And I think it's a, one of the most elegant teachings he ever gave about the arc of the spiritual path. And so if you take this saying that Buddha said, I teach suffering and I teach the cessation of suffering. And you replace those two words with form and formless. I think you have the heart of what our, our spiritual path is. Form, to the degree that we attach to it, leads to suffering. When we see the world as things that are separated 
when we see ourselves as a thing that is separated, these things have edges and they rub up against each other and they create conflict. They create struggle. They create suffering. Form is anything that we construct and, and grab onto. We do with our minds all the time. We see the world as things, and there are no things here. There's no thingness in reality. But we, we imagine that's the way we see the world often, at least in terms of consensual reality. We see each other as separated objects. So I think if you look at this beautiful teaching of the Buddha, you can actually, and he traces it in the four foundations of mindfulness. You start with form, the body, the most basic reality we have, and then you go to emotions. And the Buddha is talking about emotions in a very clear way. He's saying the emotions we have is either it's either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. No story. No story. What happened to the story? We don't need a story to have an emotion. Although usually we think of, we have lots of stories with our emotions, don't we? Create suffering, a lot of suffering. So the Buddha is talking about emotion in a very clear way. It's either pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. My teacher, Trungpa Rinpoche, used to say, the, if, if, the, if, the, if the emotion is pleasant, we, we lay out a waterbed. And if it's unpleasant, we, hold, we, we, we grab a shotgun. There's no, nothing in the middle there, particularly with emotions. They're very dualistic that way. Can you think of a middle emotion between those two? It's not pleasant or unpleasant other than neutral. And then the third foundation of mindfulness is where we really get the, what the spiritual path is, the inflection point. The third foundation of mindfulness is foundation of mind. How do you look at the mind? Because the mind is looking at the mind. How do we do that? I always say in these beginning courses, you're not the voice in your head, you're the one who hears the voice in your head. That's mind. You see, we're, if we don't actually get curious about reality and how we do things here, and we sit down long enough to start questioning all these things we've learned growing up, all the stories people have told us. If we don't question that, then, then we just, just we, we, we live our life based on assumptions that we don't examine. But if you, if you sit down long enough to be with yourself and look at things here, you start to notice that you're, there is that in you which can watch the content of your consciousness. And that we could call formless awareness. Formless awareness isn't a thought. It's not a form. You can't think it. It doesn't discriminate. Formless awareness is the spiritual path that we're moving towards. That's the cessation of suffering. That's this what we mean by emptiness. In the Soto Zen tradition, we speak of this meditation as shikantaza, turning the light inward. So in the beginning of practice, we emphasize the mechanics. Sit with a good posture, count your breath, follow your breath, all important to build a foundation. 
And as you move into this practice and internalize it and do it regularly, you start to notice that if you keep trying to do it, you begin to get in your way. And so you, this, the inflection point of the spiritual path is you realize you've got to get out of your own way. That's hard to do. Because our, our own stuff is very um, seductive. Our own, my own soap opera is, it's my soap opera after all, it's not yours. And I'm very possessive about it, you know, it's my drama. It's very seductive, and yet it leads to so much suffering. So this inflection point, which is moving towards letting go of my need to control, my need to be right, uh, my need to win the struggle, whatever it is, that's the spiritual path we're on. And that's why we could say that's leading to the cessation of suffering, moving in the direction of less suffering, more joy, more love, compassion, kindness, connection. I'll just finish by saying that I think that we generally trust the, the play that's in front of us. We, we go to the theater or you, you turn on, uh, you go and watch a movie on Netflix and you're paying attention to the stage that the story is being told on. Whether you're in the theater or you're watching a movie, you don't really think about what's happening in the back of the stage, all the, things that people are doing to make that drama happen on the stage in front of you or all the cameramen and the editing and the, all the stuff people have done to make that movie on Netflix that you can now watch. You don't think about the back end behind the stage, but in a sense, the spiritual path is noticing all of a sudden there's something behind the, the stage. There's something behind the story. And I would suggest to you that that's what we're trusting. In a spiritual tradition, we begin to trust not necessarily what we see, not necessarily what we think, or what, how we want something to be, or what we're wishing for, but what's going on behind the curtain? And uh, I think, so maybe we could, so we'll have a little discussion about that. Uh, any any thoughts, comments? Anybody? Microphone sitting there. I know it's a, it seems like a long way to get up out of your chair and go grab that, but go ahead. Yay, can. Okay. I never thought I'd hear that. <laughs> um, it's the concept that really helped me the most as I've been on this path is the idea of the second arrow. Uh -huh. Okay. And the idea is that you can get shot in the leg with an arrow and it hurts. There is pain. The second arrow in the exact same spot is not twice as painful. It is incredibly exponentially more painful. And we shoot that arrow at ourselves. Yeah. And, and the idea of, okay, so basically my inflection point has been, um, okay, there's pain in the world. Okay. But the suffering, if, if, if the only thing I can do is eliminate the self-imposed suffering, mm -hmm. the discursive thoughts, the ego going wild, uh, the blame, the separation, all of that, that's a huge step. And, and I'm actually finding it tough to move. I almost broke my cup. Darn broken table. 
Um, but but the idea is moving past that for me is becoming incredibly difficult because I find myself grasping onto that preliminary, mm. I, you know, lack of suffering, if you will. Yeah. So what Ken is bringing up here is a really important point. Uh, when we say we're um, waking up or being enlightened doesn't mean that we're not going to experience suffering, old age, sickness, uh, grief, losing people we love. It, it, when we're talking about suffering here that we're uh, being free of, it's a reaction to that pain. So I might uh, have a, maybe I have a pain in my stomach. I have a stomach ache and uh, that, that pain is real. I can't necessarily get rid of that stomach pain. Maybe I could eat better food or exercise more, but it's my reaction to that. It's my panic that arises when I feel that pain in my stomach. That's the suffering we're talking about. It's the reaction to, to the human condition that's the suffering we're talking about that you can, you can heal. So, uh, and that's not easy to do when it comes to our bodies and you have pain in your body, uh, there is almost always the, the, the reaction to the pain. And that's what we're talking about. Healing is that, that reactive the thing that we do when suffering arises. So our practice is to bear witness to the suffering, to not run away from it, not necessarily grovel in it either, but to acknowledge the, the pain is real in the body, if I have it, but I notice that I have a reactive panic going on in relationship to that pain, and that's the, that's the suffering we can heal. Not easy to do, right? And almost always that reactivity brings a story. Almost always, there's a story that goes with that. You know, we're more interested in the story than just placing our shoes by the door. We don't think there's anything particularly important about how we place our shoes by the door. We're, we're much more, we think it's much more important our own drama. And I think when you, when you do this practice over time, you begin to see that the, the details of life matter. That's where we're living. That's not abstract. But where we often live in our heads is with our stories, our fears, our, uh, our desires. Uh, the Buddha said the cause of suffering is grasping, holding on to form, holding on. That's the grasping wanting it to be something else, wanting my pain in my stomach to not be there. That's suffering. Grasping, grasping on the form. Any other thoughts or comments? We're almost done here. Is this helpful? One thumb up from Gary, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, please, um, I invite you to continue uh, making uh, meditation a regular part of your life. We have a morning meditation here at the Zen Center. Monday through Friday online and in the Zendo. You can come here and sit. Monday through Friday, 7 to 7.45 in this Buddha hall, if you're in the neighborhood, or you can, you can easily find the link to our online uh, meditation, uh, Zoom link, and click on that link at seven o'clock or anytime between seven and 7.45, join us through your computer online and get support from the community because let's face it, meditation is not so easy to do. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to forget about, <clears throat> about why this is important, why it does matter. 
And so when we sit with each other as a Sangha, we support each other. You know, we, we need that. None of us is a strong enough to do any of this all by ourselves. We need each other and more than ever now. Uh, who knows what's going to happen this year? <laughs> yeah, we were glad we survived 2023. Are we going to survive 2024? Who knows what's going to come? What kind of chaos and disruption we're going to experience? What kind of disheartening ex uh, emotions we're going to have? And so we need community as a, as a, uh, a ground, a basis for our well-being. And this Sangha is precious. So I hope you will uh, take care of each other, take care of yourselves, and have a joyful 2024. I'll put my credit card away before I lose it. I have this new fancy wallet.